divide and rule taxes is also played okay the Ghanaians, the Africans on the continents don't want to see you in the first place they are not welcoming you they live in a jungle they don't have food they don't have education and all of that right, right. what's your experience about that too um, my experience um, you mean about the way that Africa is portrayed yeah people? I mean the, the division that keep trying to keep us separated the Africans on the diaspora and the Africans on the continent well um, I think that um well what i usually feel is that um how do i say this i'm sorry do you mind repeating that one more time <laughs> yeah yeah what, what i mean is that you know um i don't know if you you you've experienced it before yeah. but you you were here and you talk about the african americans they're oh stop talking about okay, them right, right. they're violent they are lazy they right. don't like you know they are right. they are they are not peaceful, right. guns and all of that. Then you are there and you talk about Africa and you have people tell you the whole, oh, forget about Africa. Right. They live in the jungle, they don't, don't want to welcome you yeah. and all of that. Oh, okay. Did you meet this? Yeah, oh, of course. Yeah, and get, get, get close up <laughs> to um, I definitely encountered this. You know, being raised by Ghanaian parents in the States, mm. I get all of that. Um, you know, like, you know, don't hang around with them and... Um, hmm. very, they, they, they used to tell you oh yes if you can't be <laughs> African in the States and not have heard this from your parents hmm. oh yes it's it comes with the territory um, but I feel like being you know younger we kind of understand that and on, our parents see us as African everybody else sees us as black so you, no we're just bonded by that as well so. what was it what's the meaning what's, what's the difference between being an African and black over there well, over there, being an African means that, you know, you're, you're from, from Ghana, Africa. you're from Nigeria. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It, it doesn't, they don't really correlate the fact that, you know, any black skinned person is ultimately an African. Exactly. Hmm. Um, so there's a divide there just to begin with. Um, and it's usually, you know, driven by your parents in the beginning, hmm. you know, like don't make friends with those people or, um, hmm. and things like that. And also when you have friends who are african-american and you know they're asking you african questions like you know do you speak african so is there a... <laughs> right or um i remember when i was in college and mm -hmm. remember i said college mm -hmm. um my roommate asked we were just you know there were a few africans that i were friends i was friends with and my roommate was i believe she was from the caribbean and she asked one of my friends if we had an airport <laughs> yes, uh -huh. I was very, very surprised that someone could make it all the way here and, you know, to college and be able to ask such a question. So that let me know that people aren't really taught anything about what Africa truly is. Mm. Um, no, the world around them. Exactly, exactly. Um, exactly. The, wor the world around them, especially if you are African American in the States. Mm. It doesn't benefit anyone making money off of you if you understand that, you know. Africa is a great place full of wonderful resources and is the richest continent like in the world. It would give you way too much pride and they can't afford that. So. With that being said, what would you say about the system of, I, I call it systematic ignorance, yeah. that the system over there try to keep their uh, citizens in this gross ignorance because yeah. if a Ghanaian lives in Ghana and think that Americans should know everything, to be on top of everything and you, you understand <laughs> and this one i I'm, I'm using american to to kind of refer to um anyone who originally lives or let me say from america yeah. to ask you do you have airport and all of that yeah so did you take the time to when that question came to you did you take the time to think about how ignorant people can be with that oh yeah um i've many ignorant statements of uh, being African and growing up African you hear a lot of um, just crazy things and you're like no oh, people don't really believe that hmm. and then you get older and then you're like wow people really do believe that um, I think that it's a huge misconception that Americans know everything hmm. and that they have the answer for everything because hmm. we 
typically don't have the answers for ourselves um, mm-hmm. and we look to higher powers mm-hmm. which is like the mm-hmm. government and things to provide said answers and um, oftentimes the answers that are given are never the answers that you need you need yeah mm-hmm. um, so then we stay in that state of ignorance and um, you know the way that the branding and everything goes and the things that they can put into your environment to make you believe mm-hmm. that you know it's this great power and you know we're all knowing um yeah it's it's omnipresent right? <laughs> like god <laughs> exactly. it's not like god anyway so um did you also take the time to break from that boundaries that your parent was setting for you that hey don't hang out with the african americans I know that at the point in time did you see the need to I mean break break loose of that absolutely um well I had friends who were African-American so of course I knew my parents were like being ridiculous mm-hmm. <laughs> um and then it, I think it all changed when I went to college and I was um, exposed to so many different people so many different um cultures um people who thought you know, with so many different mindsets and um, ways of thinking. And I think that's what kind of changed everything and erased whatever it was that my parents were trying to instill in me. Um, and also coming to Ghana, I've learned more about black people mm. living in Ghana than I ever did in the States. Wow. Right. How? Well, I feel like, um, of course, this is sort of, it's the hub, you know, mm-hmm. Africa is the hub of all you know black culture Mm -hmm. and it's also you know the motherland of Mm -hmm. course Mm -hmm. so i've encountered so many different people um in ghana Mm -hmm. you know who are here for the same reasons as i or who are here to learn um or experience and throughout the conversations we have i see how other people live and you know and things like that and i'm also able to see there are certain things in us that are innate um and just seeing Ghanaians and how we vibe and how we are with each other it makes me understand you know the spirit of black people especially okay in the States. so let me ask you did you ever felt like seriously a newcomer to the Ghanaian society when you came of course <laughs> what are some of the things that made you feel like yeah I'm a Ghanaian but I'm not have to learn yeah. how to live as a, as a Ghanaian you know it's so funny because in the states often like if I'm in the states I feel very African mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. um, I remember I watched the documentary that I related to a lot that um, asked the question am I too African to be American or too American to be African whoa right. it's profound man. I know <laughs> it messed me up completely <laughs> um, but yeah moving back to Ghana I realized just how much I was lacking um, just because when I when you're taken out of your environment and you still have bits of your culture, you feel like you know you know it. You know you know your culture. You know everything. Mm-hmm. Can't tell you anything about it. Mm-hmm. But coming to Ghana, I realized how much more there was to learn. Um, even when it came to the language, I thought I was a very fluent tree speaker. Oh, until, I was about to. Uh, we're, yeah. we're about to go there anyway. <laughs> so finish with that and let's go. Yeah, there. I thought I was you know very fluent in the language when I then I realized, um, girl, your grammar is all wrong. Hmm. Um, or there's certain things, you know, just certain little things. Like, I always knew you don't shake with your left and eat with your left. But then once I was in a marketplace and I pointed at something with my left hand because I felt that should be fine. Mm-hmm. And the market woman got so angry. Not angry, but, like, she really told me about myself. Mm. Like, as I should know better and mm-hmm. things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are always small little details that remind me that, you know, although... I was born of Ghanaian parents. It doesn't put me ahead of anybody else, mm. you know, who mm. may not have been or is, you know, part of the diaspora but not directly from mm. um, Ghana. It doesn't put me ahead of anyone else because in the end we all have so much to learn. And that's why we're here. Okay. I think I am enjoying the conversation right now. So if you're listening and you have a question or contribution um, towards this discussion, this is the diasporan conversation or the diasporan dialogue right here on s live africa good morning africa is the name of the show send us your whatsapp messages on 024-778596 024-778596 if you're listening from outside of ghana then you have to add the country code which is plus 233 
then you add the number two four seven seven eight five nine eight six and i will read your messages loud and clear here for you let's go for a musical break the same music for mosibisa welcome home and we'll be back to talk about more especially what you're doing here the kind of business you're doing here in ghana and all of that Music in the background from OC Bisa, and I think I have some messages here. And um, this one, um, let me get it right. This one coming from Ayo Dele Sosu. He say, ask her what is she doing to encourage other diasporan Africans to come home. So that's your first question from a listener. Oh, thank you, listener. <laughs> um, I think it's imperative that we all lead by example mm. um you can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk but at the end it's about action mm. um so i feel like just being here is a message um the way that i live my life in the states people always wonder will she even survive <laughs> um why why would they wonder? i don't know um i think because you know i you know i'm a young young single woman mm -hmm. um i like i enjoy going out going to restaurants you know visiting art shows and you know doing those things so i guess people are under the impression that we do not have a thriving um and cultured art community here mm -hmm. so what i do is i make sure i go to these places and i make sure that they see these places and i am always encouraging people to you know look more into African pop culture. Mm. Um, I use all of my platforms um, to encourage this. On my personal Instagram, I do many video blogs mm. of the different places that I go, the people that I, I meet, and things like that. Um, just to let people know what the day to day life is in, in, in Africa, right? Mm. Um, in a more realistic have you, have you, way. Have you sent the, the picture of the Kotokan example to them? No, <laughs> <laughs> just joking. Right. Mm. Um, additionally, um, one of my projects that I'm working on here is to create a, um, a guest house for people of the diaspora who are looking to come down and live within a community and get an authentic Ghanaian experience. Wow. Um, in addition to that and through that, which is called Villa Diaspora, so that should give you a sense of exactly what we're doing. Mm. Um, I also um, host individuals for cultural immersion experiences um, because there are people who are very curious about Africa but do not want to just come and be like any random you know a dime a dozen tourists and mm. i understand that so what i've done in the past is um accept people into um villa diaspora and have them live amongst you know the community the online people exactly and if there's so it doesn't be like a tourist who are coming living in a splash hotel right or at airbnb <laughs> and things and there's nothing wrong with that there are a lot of mm. cool airbnbs that are mm. in the communities but um, and I also tailor their experience to whatever it is that they are on the continent to do. So mm. if you are here and maybe want to learn about something in particular, what I do is I facilitate that and make sure that you're connected with the right people. Mm. Because oftentimes I hear many, many stories of people who come down and encounter the wrong people. That, that's that's yeah. so true. So, right. so that's why I, when you sent me that message about yourself, I was so happy about that because it's so wrong when people especially um our brothers and sisters african americans come and they they go into the hands of the wrong people right, and right. already they have a lot of, of fear right. and paranoia about about coming here and they get here and get into the hands of the wrong people and and for that it happens everywhere it does, yeah. you understand so uh, i think it is good people like you are doing that dr canada goes that I, I i sometimes call him like do you sleep at all? Right. Do you have time for yourself? Because <laughs> every time you see her do something for days and that, yeah. and I think we really need um, more people to go into that so that when the people come, they really get into the right hands so that within a short time they get themselves acquainted with the areas and they can move on absolutely, their own. Absolutely. Yeah. So practically, what are some of the things that you take these people through so that with time they can be on their own? And also, for example, I had a guest who was sitting in your chair and was like, 
she will go to the market and because her accent is different yeah. the price will be mentioned <laughs> differently so, so how do you try to help people navigate through all of these things well i actually recently hosted um a young lady i mm. think she was also a guest on your show her name was imagine yeah Yes. Yeah. So for the she was here for about three months. Uh, she wanted to study herbal medicine. Mm-hmm. So um, we put her in touch with the right people mm-hmm. um, that she needs to be in touch with in order to learn as much as she can. And for about the first two months, um, we were just like connected, mm-hmm. you know, at mm-hmm. the hip, so that she knows. So if she, I'm going, she, she, has she gone back? Yes. Okay. She left, I believe, um, mid November. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we go to the market you know we're together so that she knows what the typical usual prices of things are Mm -hmm. you know we take public transportation Mm -hmm. um so that she knows how much you should typically pay Mm -hmm. um and just in the day-to-day ins and outs you know with me seeing how i maneuver through Mm -hmm. you know ghana through accra and even if we travel um i think that leading by example was really really important Mm -hmm. because then she can see in wait in um she can see the places in which I'm comfortable and the places mm. yeah, places no. in which I'm not. Mm. So that it gives her like a base of, you know, how to maneuver through certain spaces and um, things like that. So um, I think that that was monumental in, you know, making her independent in her last month. In mm. her last month, she can direct... She was, she was moving everywhere right. herself. <laughs> exactly. She's like going to the market. She's buying this. She's buying that. She made it all the way here by herself. Um, and yeah. She can direct you anywhere in Ghana. And I'm bad with directions. So oftentimes, she would be directing me, to be quite honest. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you also told me off air uh, mm-hmm. on WhatsApp about a center. Uh, uh, apart from the guest house that you're, you're building, you, you also mentioned some... Oh, yes. I believe um, my online platform, which is the African Accent, that's it. That's the one. What, what, is, what is that about? Well, the African Accent provides a platform for um, artisans and artists and creative entrepreneurs mm. who we might see, on, you know, from people who we might see selling their goods on the side of the road to people with, you know, thriving brands who want to explore and expand their markets. Mm-hmm. I give them the platform to put on display true African products uh, made with true African quality. Mm. Um, and additionally, I use that platform to share um, African pop culture mm. by... In particular? In particular, I think it's very important for people to understand that we have our own driving pop culture here. Mm. Mm. From the music we listen to, the clothes we wear, the trends that come and go, I think it's very important to mm. see mm-hmm. that because then the rest of the world can see that w- their trends that they are currently having now and how we have influenced them. Mm. Um, because the influence goes both ways um, and I think it's important for you to for people to understand that this is the hub from which all, all black of that culture came from. Is, I always say that yeah. if we have for a musical genre if we have 10 almost at least 7 to 8 were invented by the black people right, right. Yeah. exactly So, and I also give um, a platform for you know the influencers mm. who are actually driving forth these um, all the bits of popular culture um, mm. I give them a space to just explore um, next year I'll be starting a, a video series where I follow a few influencers who are leading the way in fashion art music design um, architecture just innovate you know mm. innovations mm. Mm. to and even literature Mm. to share their stories and you know to follow them around to see what it's really like and just for us to see that there really isn't much of a difference Mm. you know between those in the states who are influencers and those of us here and i'm told you yourself you are an an artist (laughs) which of the categories do you belong well i wouldn't call myself an artist you told me an up and coming and (laughs) aspiring So which one are you aspiring to uh, become? I always say I'm, I'm not an artist, but I'm artistic. <laughs> okay. Um, and I'm actually an aspiring stand, stand-up comedian. Mm. I haven't been funny just yet because, you know, when talking about my first love, Ghana, it's, you know, it's a bit serious. But mm-hmm. um, I am an aspiring comic. I will be performing at my first uh, stand-up comedy show 
on Friday at the Shop Accra. Well, where is it? It's in Usu. Shop Accra. B Shop Accra. Okay. I'm bad with directions, like I said before. So don't no ask. problem. <laughs> so so we'll, anyway, so if you are if you are in Ghana and even if you are not in Ghana, you want to be there. Mm. Just just keep in touch, and uh, you will know where the event is going to happen. So so can you give us a just or oh, oh, let me put that one at the end of everything. Oh boy. So 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 that you give us something. <laughs> So that we, we I, I told you I'm, I I prepared my refs mm. uh, for that. So so now there's a, there's a there's a segment or a yeah. part in the, on this diasporian dialogue that we call the shocks. The shocks. Okay. The shocks. You you have barely mentioned some of them, but I want to officially ask you, what were your shocks, being good or bad, when you step foot in Ghana? Well, my shocks were. Visual. <laughs> um, I think most people see the litter and they're like, oh my goodness, this is terrible. But they, they, they see what? The, the litter, the garbage, and things mm-hmm, like that. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But it's not my first time here, so it wasn't that much of a shock to me. Mm-hmm. However, I did find like the skin bleaching to be a bit shocking. <laughs> Fist bump to that. <laughs> um, just because, you know, when I left the States, you know, it was all about the melanin movement Mm. you know Mm. everybody's embracing their dark features you know their you know their their dark skin and Mm. their black african features right um so coming here i just felt it it's it's so funny i come from a place of white privilege Mm. and only to land in a place of light skin privilege (laughs) (laughs) you know so that was a bit shocking for me. Mm. Um, and also, I think one another thing that was shocking was, um, you know, the relationship between like males and females, you know, and mm-hmm. the disparities there. Um, like, 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 go go deeper into that. Go deeper. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I just found it very interesting, you know, while talking to my peers, the way that they felt about certain things um, concerning women's rights. Mm. Um, someone told me, well, in America, women have too many rights. And I'm like, what do you even say? <laughs> How do you even sound? Because we're constantly fighting for more. Mm. Um, <laughs> I, I you make my bo- you make my boss laugh. <laughs> so you see my point. <laughs> um, yeah. So I found that very shocking, and um, you know, just to see the limited rights that you know. I mean, women do have rights here, but I think a lot of them may not be aware of what they are. Mm. Um, and I found that to be very interesting because when you don't know your rights, you're liable to fall into the hands of the wrong people mm. um, and putting um, your trust into the wrong people. Okay. You know, you might go to an advisor, you know, versus going to the law. And that advisor may have their own ulterior motives or their own loyalties and, you know, politics and things like that. Um, So I found that to be very, very, very surprising. Um, But I there are also organizations out here to combat that, which I think is Mm. very admirable. Mm. Um, One of them is Drama Queens GH. Mm. And I'm actually performing at their um, um, at their open mic and poetry show. Um, They make it a point it's they they make it a point to um speak up for women's rights Mm. um teach young girls about their rights don't you think you you women as you said you have more than necessary (laughs) right but maybe masculine society has made you people think you don't have any last week i was here with dr kambon i know you know dr kambon you can be African American <laughs> in Ghana and don't know Dr. Kambo. Right. And we we're talking about last that was last two weeks talking about the position, the place of the African woman in ancient times. And we got to know that there have been African women who were rulers, not Absolutely. of nations, not, not of uh, countries, but empires. Yes. African women who owned properties, owned I mean everything. Mm-hmm. So so I think it's just a matter of just having this idea and start living like that. Well, it, you know, an idea mm. is one thing, mm. but there has to be systems. Anyway, um, somebody has sent me the direction to where you're going to perform. Awesome. The, <laughs> the shop also is it Aqua Jane down the Aqua Jane Park. Anyway, it's not that clear, but I think it's okay. 
we'll, we'll, we'll do more with Google Google Map and we'll yes. get it. So if you put into Google Maps, mm. we shop Accra, mm. it'll come up then. You mm. can find me there Friday night at 7 p.m. Okay. Yeah, so, so you were talking about, I was talking about the fact that you women already have mm. too, ma- too many rights that maybe you are not activating. Well, would you say that men have too many rights or just men have rights? Men have rights, just exactly. like you. Are you sure? Yeah. Yes. But I think because because I, I um, from historical perspective, yeah. it's like we we are, we are living in a man's world, kind of. Yeah, you, you understand. We are living in a, ma- a man's world, and um, that's kind of we men are now dictating the narrative and everything, and making it seem like women has never come closer to power, right. leadership, exactly. and all of that. And I am saying that you have done all of that before. Yes. So it's just a matter of just reconnecting and as if if you're a woman, say that if my ancestors women have done this before, then I don't think I even have to cry for it. I just have to start living it. Okay. Sure. So you know what we'll do? We'll mm. get a woman, we'll train her mm. to run for office and then go there and say, you know, we've done this before and I'm about to do it again <laughs> and see what happens. Anyway, anyway. Mm. That that's 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 amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. So um, let's look at doing business yeah. because some of your people who will be watching and listening to you right now will not only want to come and see how nice Ghana is, how receptive Ghana people are and all that, but want to come and do business. Yeah, to invest in the company. You, you, the you are into business here. Yes. How, how is it going? Um, and what are some of the businesses you think you, you can recommend to people to come into? Well, I have a friend of mine who wholly believes that, you know, the biggest thing to invest in in Ghana are the people. Mm. You know, um, I think the president said it recently, we have the youngest population Mm -hmm, on this continent. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what's important is to put that to use. Um, You know, it's not about digging into the ground and finding the minerals Mm -hmm, or anything mm -hmm. else. Like, the most valuable parts of our country are those people walking on this very ground mm. that we're trying to dig up something from. Mm. Um, so you really don't have to look that far. That and um, technology mm. um, is a huge thing to invest in at this moment. Um, there are so many people who are um, within this particular sector and making things happen. And um, I think they say necessity is the mother of all invest- invention. invention. Yeah. <laughs> You've got many, mm. many needs. Um, just to make things um, more convenient Um, because look at Uber Uber Mm. came and at first there was some you know issues right right what's this Uber thing but now most people use Uber a lot of people Mm. you know are less um, are more receptive to it Mm. Um, so and there are many people who are looking at things like let's say you want to go run errands and you see this traffic outside you're mm. like oh hell no mm-hmm. right um someone just um created a courier app mm-hmm. where if you need something taken here or there or need something picked up just get on this app and voila everything is you know you speak french oh, no, I, don't. I only know like five french words ah. <laughs> that was the, one way, the, way, the way you said voila i was like no <laughs> uh, yeah. Sure, right back at you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay, so so yeah, but what what do you, what else do you think uh, well, is something that we people can people want to come down can come down and go into? Well, definitely invest in the people, um, whether it's you know creating, building, um, and also technology. I think that is the one that's worth you know investing in the most at this moment because technology is taking over mm-hmm. the world we i don't have to tell you that mm-hmm. you already know that mm-hmm. um and there's so many bright brilliant brains here in ghana mm-hmm. um so any way that you can invest i would definitely um you know do that and um, i know a lot of people who are investing in real estate um sort of like myself but not really um what i'm doing is creating a space for people to come to Mm. um also if you want to create a space where people of the diaspora can come and feel comfortable get acclimated Mm. you know see Mm. and understand the continent and things like that it would also be wise for you to invest in tourism Mm -hmm. um ghana has some of the most beautiful spaces and a lot of um 
a lot of them are underutilized. Mm -hmm. um, so investing in re um, the tourism sector and just helping Ghana shine, you know, you would always be, well, I don't quote me, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, I feel like there's just not a, there's no shortage of beautiful things to see in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't see these things. So bringing it to people would be very lucrative in my opinion. That's amazing. That that's amazing. So you've been here um since two thousand fifteen? Yes, off and on since twenty fifteen but permanently since June. Since June. Yes. And and how, how how is mom and dad now relating to you? Well, I think in the beginning <laughs> they didn't really take me too seriously. Hmm. Just because it's like, yeah, okay, sure. Let's see how you survive out there without all your, you know, your comforts and everything your, your, else. Your ideas. Right. <laughs> Um, but what I found is I found a feeling that is more comforting than all the other comforts than mm. the Starbucks coffee on every corner and the free Wi-Fi <laughs> and everything else you know it's a feeling of being home and um, I want to invest in home you know I feel like my time energy resources would be better utilized here and there's so much happening in Ghana especially and I want to be a part of Ghana's success story. Wow. Yes. Wow, you have no idea how that just moved me. <laughs> yes. So that's my story. Um, and I mean, my parents now, I think they see things a bit differently as well. Hmm. Because, you know, they went from being the parents to say, oh, don't hang out with these people. And, you know, I cut that this and that. So now understanding, you know, you know, I have brothers, so they understand, you know, what it means to have black sons out there, and when they go out, what, you know, how your how your heart sinks, mm. you know, so they get it, like. So so um, do you think it, it, a time is coming, and what do you think will happen or will be done to bridge this gap between the Africans from the continent mm -hmm. and the African? who were taken to the outside of the continent to mm -hmm. a, a slave trade. Is there an understanding that's emerging? Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. And it's emerging in, in ways that you probably wouldn't imagine. Hmm. Um, Tell me some of that. Like in music. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything. Yeah, you just had me uh, playing a song which had three songs. Right. Uh, Stone Boy and other other African from other African countries. Exactly, mm. um, and it's not just you know Ghana doing it. I like that it, the continent is, as a whole, is you know just being sought after by people who look like us. Mm. You know, who people who came from us, mm. and you know they are intrigued and they're interested. Um, also in fashion, so many people are you know, enjoying and exploring, you know, African fashions, whether it's, you know, the prints, the kente, the batik, whatever it is, people are utilizing it um, and sharing parts of their culture that they can grasp and sharing that with other people and, um, and also honing in and trying to understand it themselves. Um, additionally, art. Um, There's so many artists out there doing amazing work that are sharing, um, <clears throat> they're sharing bits and parts of their culture as well and they have people who are patronizing mm -hmm. um, so that goes to show you that you know there's a need and there are people out there who are fulfilling the need and I think it's um, a lot a lot of it also has to do with social medias mm. and you know technology the internet now we are able to share what the truth about Africa is um, on a whole other level that we've never ever been able to share before mm. Um, so I think, you know, as far as like being an activist for sharing the true Africa and bridging the gap, it's definitely emerging and starting. And I, I believe strongly that it's not a trend because oftentimes like you'd sit back and say, well, in a few months, this is going to be over and everybody's going to go back to wearing something mm -hmm. else. Like mm -hmm. what other culture is going to be appropriated next? Mm -hmm. But I don't see it as cultural appropriation um, for the most part because... I see people trying to connect, and I think putting the label of cultural appropriation, cultural appropriation on that, is um, it kind of takes away from what people are trying to do, what people are trying to learn, the connections that people are trying to make, because once you've been kept away from so long, um, and you know the idea of Africa has been poisoned to you that we're like in trees and this that, 
now a lot of people take pride in the fact that they too are you know part of the somebody African showed story. me a video from london where two africans were fighting and do you know the basis of the fight what who is more african than the other <laughs> and, and i was like whoa right. we are getting somewhere yes because in the past it would be who is L the least who is the least or who right. who is more leaning European. to white you, you mm -hmm. understand and they were fighting two girls and arguing that he is more african right he lived more african lifestyle and i was like hallelujah right, right. <laughs> we, we, we are getting somewhere like, i eat more fufu than you do <laughs> I eat more fufu. anyway i've never eaten fufu before no i don't eat fufu yet okay. <laughs> I, I think I tried it in 1992 and I nearly what? died. Oh, wow. I don't know what's in my stomach, Dad. Yeah, I, from class three up until like last year, I told, used to tell people I was allergic to <laughs> fufu. And then one day I was really, really hungry. And my aunt made some and I ate it and I was like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> so now I eat as much as I can to catch that, up. That's, that's, that's cool. Um, <clears throat> I want to know. The kind of things you studied in school, so the education and background. Well, mm -hmm. my education background has nothing to do with where I am today. If you so hear that is why I, I want to hear. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> um, I actually studied um, health and human services um, with concentration. H healthy health and human, human services. services. What does that entail? Um, I had it in my plans when I was younger to be a social worker, mm. but then I took that out of my plans. Um, and then at, at what age? Uh, I think when I graduated from the uni. Yes. Okay. Um, and then I'd gone. Which on which which uni did you attend? A uh, university at Buffalo. Okay. Yes. Huge Ghanaian population. Oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, after that, I worked for a bit in that particular field, at working with um, individuals with developmental disabilities. Mm. Um, as well as intellectual disabilities and children with emotional disabilities. Mm. Um, and then I've gone on to further my studies um, in uh, speech language pathology because I thought I wanted to be a speech language pathologist. Um, so when I came and got in 2015, I was actually, um, it was actually a really pivotal point because I was going to go to graduate school to um, complete my speech language pathology on a graduate level. But then I came to Ghana and I really had to think like, do I want to invest my time, my energy, resources into this Doing country? more schools. Right. And it's not even the school part, but the debt. <laughs> oh my goodness, the debt. Um, and it seemed very superficial. Um, but then I came here and I guess everything became super official. So, so when and how, why did you start doing what you're doing today? I started doing what I'm doing today because I love Ghana. Um, everybody loves Ghana, of course. And hey, I, I love that. You <laughs> might find somebody who wants to run away to Libya. <laughs> um, I, I doubt that. Anyone with a phone and eyes and a heart, I doubt that. They are going in their numbers, my dear. Yeah. So if you have any activist spirit in you, yeah. use part of that energy in that direction to tell people <clears throat> how. Ghana is blessed with everything. Right, right. You understand? Um, it's so funny. My dad, like I think in the seventies or early eighties, went to Libya, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that place was cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So kind of, I understand why. You know, I understand the whys because my dad did it. Um, you know, in hopes of providing a better life for his future family and things like that. And I'm super grateful for the sacrifices he made. But these sacrifices are on a whole new level. Hmm. Um, it's your freedom. Yeah. You understand? Um, so are you are you the only child of your parent? No, back I'm, the, there? I'm the well back here, yes. But I'm the oldest. Um, I have two younger brothers, and I'm the only one here. Oh, okay. And you 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 are the, the senior child. Yes. Oh wow. wow. So even in that, I'm setting examples. You know. <laughs> that, that's that's brilliant. When when Doctor Canada um. She actually helped me to get my resource people to come and sit here for the interview. Once awesome. she, she she gave me your number, she was like, "You love her. You love her stories and everything." And Aww, thanks, I Dr. think, Carnita. yeah, and I think <laughs> she 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 was right. Yeah. Um. But I think that you would ask the question of um why. Yeah. Um. Like I said, I love Ghana, and I was very sensitive to the fact that. You know, there are people who look like me, um, 
you know, meaning people with darker skin, mm-hmm. well, obviously, mm-hmm. you know, of African descent, who didn't have the same connection to the continent as I did. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted to be able to make that happen for someone because being here changed my life. Um, it made me, it gave me a sense of belonging that I wouldn't have felt otherwise mm-hmm. anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted to be able to be that connection for someone, to be that bridge for someone who can also be a bridge for someone else. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much the main. I, I have a message here from, from Michael. Michael says that, can, can your guest tell us a bit about the, the depth of racism in the state? <laughs> oh, where do I begin? Um, you know, growing up, I always felt like, you know, this is the best thing you can ever have. Well, not really, <laughs> but um, I just, you know, I was, I hate to say it, but I was one of those people who felt like, well, you know, if someone's racist, that's their problem, because mm. you know, I'm great. <laughs> um, but when I got older, and. Yeah, when I got wrong. older and I realized how, you know, because of the ways that someone might look and things like that, that mm. systematically there are certain, you know, systems put in place to make sure that they don't thrive. And that... Yeah, I, I, right. I hear that a lot from Dr. Ma Johnson's mm-hmm. teachings. Yeah. And today I have somebody sitting in front of me mentioning the systems. Right. People talk about it, but the systems. So right. go on then get to the systems some of the systems right um for example there's a place in um in the states called flint michigan Mm. and i it's embarrassing how many days like years that they've gone without clean water the water comes out of their tap brown people have to pick up bottled water every morning in order to bathe cook brush their teeth and it's not like it's not known it's not like we haven't raised our voices it's it, people have been saying it people have been you know a lot of activists have been making it known yeah i think the reason what happened in florida where the ceo of nestle came to say that water is not um, human right what? like do you what yeah. <laughs> like how could you even say such a mm, thing mm. you know it's water what's mm. next air Mm-hmm. You know, like that's insane. Water is a human right. Mm. If we didn't need it to survive, then sure. Yeah, okay. Because now people want to go into business with water and right. control it. Yeah, exactly. And mm. I feel like that's very scary. And the people who suffer the most are, you know, disadvantaged people. And a lot of these disadvantaged people, there's no coincidence that a lot of them are black. Mm. You know, um, another thing is recently I, I don't know what moved me to do this, but I googled like. The percentage of black people in the states mm. and came up with a whopping 13.3 percent mm-hmm. and i was so shocked because the way i grew up in the neighborhoods in which i grew up you if you told me it was 50 percent or 70 percent i'd believe you mm. <laughs> you know so that has it gets you thinking like why is it that we're all shoved into the same spaces mm. you know why is it that there are more african-american men in prisons than there were african-american male slaves wow Right. So, yeah, it, it, the racism, it, it goes pretty deeply. And, you know, when you're looking at it in a shallow way or on the, at the surface, it's very easy to say that, you know, we are the cause of most of the turmoil that we go through. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, we're just reacting from all the, the way that we've been treated and the positions in which we've been placed. Like, it's like that crabs in a barrel mentality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, like, how do you... What else do you expect to happen or to come from it? How else do you expect people to react? You know, but, um, yeah, it's the systems that um, <clears throat> I find the most racist. Because racist people are just people, but systems keep people down and make sure you don't thrive, your children don't thrive. It's a legacy that they've invested in. So, um, I know because of this system yeah. that has made, I also did my search and I realized that about 1 million African Americans are homeschooling their children. Mm-hmm. Um, would you want to homeschool your children? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Well, I, I mean, homeschooling your children when it's necessary, I mm-hmm. think that's 
you know, that's good. Okay, maybe because you move off the system, you yes. think in Ghana it is cool to have your kids in the classroom. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Oh, that that's 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 amazing. Yeah. However, mm. if I were living in the states, I would find it beneficial to homeschool my children, especially if I want them to understand the true history of themselves. Mm. Because in the American, the typical American classroom, African American history starts at slavery. Mm. Period. Wow. Like you didn't exist until we brought you here. Be grateful. Whoa. You know, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, and um, even in some textbooks. The word slaves are being taken out and being replaced with workers. Like, work, what does that even... Like, that's a slap in the face. Wow. You know? Um, and additionally, I feel like not enough people understand or think that... Think about the fact that other people, you know, the people who are in the higher places in the country, the 1%, a lot of them had, like, centuries, you know, of a head start before everybody else. Black people just started owning property, you hmm. know, in the grand scheme of things. You know, a lot of people are still it, earning... That blacks were not allowed to own property. No, we were, they weren't allowed to... Well, we weren't allowed to be humans, like full humans, for a really long time. Um, we're just being educated in the grand scheme of things. Um, you know, when you think of how old of a country America is in comparison to all the advancements that African Americans have made, a lot of them are more recent. And I feel like... With all the recent advancements, um, there's only more to come. You can't stifle a people for too long before, mm. you know, mm. we mm. catch up. Mm. I have my last two questions, and I'll call them last two segments for you. Sure. The first one is about religion. Okay. Are you, are you religious? <laughs> I'm not religious, though. Why? Um, I feel like the way that a lot of religions portray God make God seem very small. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like um, it's because of God that I'm here. Um, and there are certain things that I can't explain. You know, mm -hmm. there are certain mm -hmm. um, things that I'm able to manifest, mm -hmm. um, you know, and things like that. And to sit I just like I said before I think that the way that many religions portray and worship God makes him seem very small in mm. his abilities mm. what well, his or her its abilities mm -hmm. um, and I personally feel that we are created in an image but God's image is a creator and we too are creators so we're put here in that image to continue the story of creation so with the passions and everything placed inside of us they're there for a reason not to be ignored but to help you know continue the story of creation kind of like the adam and eve story mm. you know they weren't put here because they look nice naked mm. you know <laughs> <laughs> they were they're here they were put you know they were placed the way that they to were to continue um creation exactly mm. and that's why we're all here wow to continue so, so, so uh, at what point in your life did you decide that, man, religion is belittling God and um, I need to be um, a free-minded thinking person? Well, fairly young. Um, but you've done church before? Of course. Um, and it's because of church that I don't go to church. And it's not the way that you would expect. Mm. Um, my, my grandparents are Catholic. My mm. parents, well, my dad's Catholic. Um, so my mom's Catholic as well, I guess. Um, and it just wasn't moving me, you know. I knew that, you know, it's you might have been a bad girl in the eyes, man. No, I mean, like rebellious, yes, definitely. Um, and very stubborn. And once I believe something and I, you know, I see it through, I'm gonna so around, around, like around what age what are we talking about? Um, I would say 13. No. Yeah, so my I went to like a Pentecost church <laughs> Whoa. with my aunt, and I liked it. You know, it's very like lively. Yeah, lively. You know, Pentecost. Uh -huh. So I felt like if there's anywhere to get God, I think this is it. Mm. You know, because mm. um, I feel like something's supposed to move me, and Catholic church was only giving me bad knees with all that kneeling mm. and standing and kneeling. <laughs> so um, yeah, so my dad didn't really like that, so he told my aunt not to take me to church again with her and. I was just so baffled like that it's church. Mm -hmm. So then I said, well, if I can't go to church, I want to, I'm not going at all. Um, and it was me being rebellious, but I find that it's exactly what I needed. 
mm. um, because it allowed me to explore other religions um, and to understand that, listen, if someone wants to believe that the gods got together and then birthed an island called Japan, okay, that's nice. I cannot think that that's ridiculous and mm. then go ahead and believe that a virgin gave birth. You know, like, there's certain things... <laughs> I just can't, you know, I just can't disprove one and, like, beliefs are beliefs, you know? You understand? Someone like, okay, Buddha, Krishna, Mitra, all of them Mm -hmm. have one attribute, born by a virgin, resurrected on the third day, born to heaven and all of that. They have a 15. Jesus is the 16th. Right. And I'm told not to believe all of that, all of them. Mm -hmm. Why should I believe the last one who has the same attribute? That's people's question. <laughs> um, it's so funny because there's a religion called, I think, the Baha'i faith, that they believe that with each, um, with each of the times that we go through, uh, a new, I guess, savior or a new prophet is brought down from these people. Um, and I feel like that's the only relatable one that I've really seen. Mm. Like, do you know? Do you know? Do you know Prince William? Um, he, he's a he's a Ghanaian actor. Oh no! <laughs> I had you to don't? make sure because I'm like. Okay. Um, the English or <laughs> yeah, English. Yeah, yeah. Galu. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I'm not familiar. Okay. Yeah, he's listening. And say hi. Hey, Prince William. Mm. How you doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So continue with with your rebellious. Yeah. So that's what um it allowed me to look deeply into religion and not um necessarily be, you know tethered to one particular one just mm. so that I can you know, from the outside looking and explore and learn more and see what is, what suits me and the way that I feel, the way that I want to feel, um, helped me broaden my understanding and to learn as much as I could mm. so that I can arrive to this point that I am at today. Okay, so finally, give us a bit of what will happen at the Accra City where you're going to perform this Friday. <laughs> um... Well, you are going to experience um, a lot of creativity, mm. um, a lot of amazingly talented poets, mm. um, musicians, myself, mm. <laughs> um, and a so lot. So I wanted to give us a freestyle. <clears throat> a freestyle. Of some of some of your aspiring works that well, you've done. L- let me finish. You know, telling people what they always t- expect. Okay. Um, so what. Drama Queens GH has been doing for the past 16 days is raising awareness and also fighting, you know, on, uh, you know, violence against women. Um, and, <laughs> um, so this is the the culmination of all the works that they've been doing for the past 16 days, and I feel super proud to be a part of it. Hmm. Okay. So I'm interested in my. In your little dose yes. of what to expect. Yeah. Okay. Um, or oh, basically, what you do? Are you are you more into satiric kind of comedy or which one is it? Um, Romantic? Is it what is it? Well, I feel like I'm one of those people who something will happen to me, and I'm like, of course. Who else would that happen to? I am always placed in the position where the most interest I encounter the most interesting things, the most interesting people. Um, and I think it's just because, you know, I'm just open to just, you know, explore and to yeah. listen and to meet people and things like that. So I have a lot of interesting stories to share. Um, and I would like to see your face in the crowd. So I'm going to save it for Friday. Oh, come on. <laughs> okay. Well, um, one of the things that I will talk about is, um, you know, growing up African um, and certain expectations of your parents as to who they want you to become mm-hmm. um, like for instance growing up my parents <clears throat> told me that sex was like the worst thing on earth you know oh yes I know you're looking at me like mm-hmm. that's a lie <laughs> um, no, but we were all told the same oh, yes, and, yes. and the majority I, of us are struggling to yeah. leave that idea so, absolutely yeah. um, and it was so funny because then growing up like at a certain point I realized that List, like listening to the music my parents listen, listen to like the daddy Loombas and things I was like these people are trying to keep it to themselves like <laughs> <laughs> this girl need to come back right? here very soon man all the Dr. Panya mm-hmm. and the rest I was just like what oh hell no 
know. Uh-uh. Um, but yeah, so I expect to see you and um, if anyone's listening and is going to be making their way down, if you do see well, me. What was the time? The time is at 7 p.m. To? Uh, to question mark. <laughs> so probably about 10 o'clock. Yeah, I yes. think that I can, I can go home and sleep and come back to my because I, I, I come on radio from Monday to Saturday. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. you might miss me, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, um, Michelle Kunadu, we are so grateful for having you this morning on the Diasporan Conversation. And I think um, people who are going to watch this video and people who are listening right now have learned a lot and they're going to learn more. Awesome. And um, we are going to also have you back again because the experience is so big. <laughs> Sounds big. good. And Sounds I think good. Dr. Canada Gross can be a prophetess. Seriously. Everything she said <laughs> has manifested, you know. I'm just I'm just appreciative to be a part of the manifestation. Anyway. So, so um your final words and your shout out to whoever you want to say shout out to. Wow. Well, um first and foremost, shout out to the pioneers, like those making the move, you know, and showing people that it's possible mm. and inviting people to come. Um and also shout out to the Africans out there with the you know, with the friends who <laughs> make sure that the friends know that Africa is lit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and yeah, just shout out to us. Shout out to those of us being unapologetically African and proud of it. And shout out to you, DJ. Thank you. <laughs> and Prince says that, tell her that Prince Grace, chiropractic's friend, doesn't ring a bell. No. <laughs> Not yet, at least. Okay. Say so Grace, Chiropractor's friend. Do you have any friend, friend called Grace or somebody you know called Grace who owned a chiropractic center? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I did. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, so so <laughs> I think um, this is where I will allow my, my guest to rest because awesome. she's so good in speaking and everything and uh, I will be right back. Whoa. You're so amazing. Oh, thank you. It's <laughs> so sweet to see you.